Good morning. My name is Councillor Janet Jefferson. I'm the chair of the Young People's Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Welcome everyone to the meeting. Following government guidelines issued on the 23rd of March 2020 regarding public gatherings and social distancing, this meeting is being held virtually in line with the government's revised guidelines on local government decision making. Alongside the members of our committee, which we will all introduce ourselves shortly, would welcome councillors Janet Sanderson and Patrick Mulligan, our uh, portfolio holders. And also we, we should, if we can connect into uh, Professor Maggie Anderson, who was the chair of the North Yorkshire Safeguarding Children's Board, together with James Parks, who was a partnership manager. Maggie is, is trying to get back into us. Um, we've got a number of officers here today, not least the Director of Children's Services, Stuart Carlton, Amanda Newbold, the new Assistant Director of Education and Skills, Peter Thomas, the Senior Strategy and Performance Manager, and we've also got uh, Danielle Johnson and Martin Kelly. If I've missed anybody, we can revise that as we go around the room. So I'll quickly just say to uh, starting probably um, at the top of members, if we can start with um, with Lindsay, if we can introduce ourselves, go down members first, just say where we represent for the benefit of our guests, and then Thank I'll bring you. in the officers as well. Thank you very much. So it's Lindsay Bermolton Ward. Stephanie. Good morning all, it's Stephanie Duckett and I'm Selby and Balby Division. Councillor Cliff Lund. Uh, Cliff Lund, Selby Britain Division. Councillor Mann. Councillor Richard Mus Musgrove. Yeah, Councillor Richard Musgrove from Eskrick Division. Councillor Plant. Bill Plant, Whitney Spencer. Councillor Jill Quinn. Jill Quinn, Councillor for Mid Craven. Councillor Annabelle Wilkinson. Good morning, Councillor Annabelle Wilkinson from Swell Division. Can we introduce our parent governor that's joining us today? Tom Taylor, Tom Campbell Taylor, a parent governor. Our representative from the secondary teachers. Morning, everybody. It's Ross Strack from Thank secondary you. school uh, teachers representation. Yeah. Uh, the primary teacher representative. Uh, the two volunteer sectors starting with both David, so whoever wants to go first. Uh, David Sharp, voluntary sector representative. Thank you. Uh, David Watson, the other voluntary sector representative. Thank you. Our two portfolio holders starting with Janet. Um, my mute keeps coming on and off. Sorry, good morning, everybody. I'm Janet Sanderson, Executive Member for Children's Services, and I represent Thornton Dale Ward. Councillor Mulligan. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Patrick Mulligan, I'm the Exec Member for Education and Skills, representing the Airedale Division. Right. Um, members, I don't know whether Maggie uh, Atkinson has actually got into us yet, but maybe as the officers come to do each respective item, I'll introduce them as we go along. Um, so have we got any declarations of interest, please, for this meeting? Thank you. That's non-recorded. Any public questions, please, Ray? Uh, no public questions received, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just make a quick remark that this is the first full meeting we've had since the 28th of February. We have had one-to-one um, -one virtuals with the group. We had an excellent presentation on our SEND. We also had a one-to-one -one with our director, uh, Stuart Carlton, on how we effectively were going to safely get our children back to school. And we've had other intermediate ones for the LAC group uh, and through our children's champion. Right, without further ado, we will try to go to item five, which is the safeguarding children covering a report to us and this is taken forward by um, Maggie Atkinson, who is the chair of the of the North Yorkshire Safeguarding Children's Board, helped by James Parks. Has Maggie managed to log in, please? 
Uh, good morning, good morning uh, Councillor. Good morning, Councillor. Good morning, Councillor. I'm, I'm joining you. I'm joining you as a disembodied voice by telephone only. Uh, That's brilliant. But you're here. Valiantly. Thank you Everybody very much. Everybody tried valiantly to, to get me on Teams, and it's just not going to happen. I really apologise for that. Um, Don't worry. In brief, it, in brief, this report covers only the first six months of operation of the new partnership. The board having stood down and the Children's Trust having also stood down to make one strategic partnership across North Yorkshire. So the flavour of this report should be all agency, because that's what the partnership is. Um, a great deal of continuity went from the board into the partnership in terms of people who were playing key roles in the subgroups, which is where the business now takes place. Um, so you have a very healthy and very positive approach to partnership, not only because you believe in your children and young people, but also because a lot of the people sitting at the table are the same. Um, there's a great deal to celebrate in the way that the partnership ran for its first six months. There'll be another report due fairly soon on the second six months so that we have the full annual picture. But to give you a flavour, the subgroups run very well. Uh, the executive has grown in strength and challenge both to uh, each member of the executive and to the group chairs and theme chairs who come and report on a cyclical basis to the partnership executive. Um, issues are not ducked. Issues are picked up and people ask the right questions and probe each other in the right discussions and debates. Um, towards the end of the report, I do hope you've had the chance to read it in detail, but if I skip to what needs to come next, that will interest you as scrutiny members, I think, uh, potentially more than simply reflecting on what's already gone. Um, so from page 28 onwards, I, we're looking at potential future priorities. Uh, after a day held at the end of February, and we've had another since then, um, uh, only a few weeks ago. So we are looking at whether we can actually make sure that information is properly shared. Um, the potential for a board that sits under the exec that is made up of key leaders and uh, chairs of uh, the subgroups of the board so that business is shared across the themes as well as being delved into within each theme. Um, they need to make sure that relevant agencies are kept at the table. So people like schools, voluntary sector bodies, faith community bodies, um, your district councils, your parish and town councils are all relevant agencies, as are your cadet groups and other uniformed bodies. And we need to make sure that they see their role in safeguarding is very central to how children fare across the county. And the new uh, growing, growing up and being young in North Yorkshire documentation that's due out soon as a final document will hopefully progress that work and it will account in turn back to the partnership. Um, we are desperate to make sure that people keep in mind all of the big wider issues that face families, so poverty and housing and all of those issues that rise in, in children's lives that are not directly connected to children's services. Um, making sure that uh, services continue to boast and to celebrate when things go well. There's a flavour of those in this report but we know as an executive that there is much more going on. And I know as scrutineer that I hear about it whenever I drop in virtually these days to the subgroup meetings. Um, making sure that what's happening on the ground is fed up back into the strategic layers of every organisation and then into the partnership so that we can both celebrate and where we need to probe. Um, and on page 29, you'll see the beginnings of some of that probing. Some of it has been led by your children and young people. So the middle bullet point in the right hand column, the issues to do with SEND, health and other service environments, are part of what preoccupies your children and young people. Um, as are the remarks in that section of the report on the need to ensure that emotional and mental health services are available at the earliest point of need and don't wait for a child to reach crisis point before somebody intervenes. Um, the need to address the continued uh, eagerness or reticence in information sharing when something about safeguarding in a child's life needs to be shared. 
and there is already work ongoing on the third bullet point in that right hand column on addressing what's happening and getting under the numbers of crime including violent crime where a child is the victim and or the child there may be a child perpetrator so there is work ongoing on that um, and i'm sure you Stuart can pick up detailed questions but i am here if you have general ones but of course because i can't see you i'm not sure what the body language is doing whereas Stuart and james can see you and they be sure but between the three of us i'm sure we can answer the questions that you might have chair and i'm open to those questions being asked thank you thank you very much maggie um it was very remiss of me um, to interrupt you now, but we forgot to really ratify the minutes of the previous meeting. I think we'll just do this first, if you don't mind. And I'll pass over to Councillor Julian. Is that OK? And then we'll then we'll go on. I just want to remind members that we are on gallery view until the next speaker, because obviously Maggie is on the phone. So um, we'll we'll bring the minutes of the meeting of the previous meeting after this item. OK. Sorry about that. It's, uh, the screen went a bit haywire. So, have we got any questions for Maggie, please? I'm looking for the hands up. We've got one hand up, but I can't see who the person is because they're not on the screen. It's me, Councillor Jefferson. Annabelle Wilkinson. Thank you, Councillor well, Annabelle Wilkinson. Will you give your question, please? Sorry. Yes, yes thank you, Chair. Um, it's actually relating to the child death overview uh, report. Do you want that question now? Um, I, I think I think that's the, that's the second report um, on our list of things to bring sorry. to you. But, but um, I'll, I'll be guided. I'll be guided by you, Councillors. I'm really sorry. I can't see you. <laughs> Are you happy to wait while we conclude this first part, Councillor Wilkinson? Of course, sorry, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction. Um, we've got a question from Councillor Lindsay Burr. Um, yes, thank you for your um, update. I just wanted to ask you um, about referrals and especially to CAMS and how we're actually coping um, with those referrals. Um, I, I don't have numbers uh, at my command at the moment, um, but what I can tell you is that your children and young people are less concerned about referrals into very high-end professional services and much keener to have access to and availability of um, pastoral and potentially counselling work in their schools, in their youth activities, in communities before things reach a point where they need a specialist. Um, very often what they told us as a board and then as a partnership um, is that what they're, what they're keen to do is to have access to somebody who will simply listen and help them to ask their big questions about life without necessarily being either a psychiatric nurse or a psychiatrist or psychologist. They feel that they're very long wait for very specialists help is getting in the way to some degree of them sharing their problems earlier with somebody who can simply listen and help them work their way through the fog. Um, but Stuart may have, and I recognise that Stuart is indicating, and he may have uh, further information since this report was written. So I'll pass back to you, Chair, if that's all right. Thank you. I'll hand over to Stuart Carlton just to clarify. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. That's really helpful. Um, so, um, uh, our CAMS um, saw what um, most of the CAMS services national, nationally did was reductions in referrals during the height of the lockdown. Um, that, that's to be expected because many of the referrals come through schools um, and GPs and clearly families weren't accessing those things. However, um, what we have done is there was a grant available to us as a local authority to prepare for the emotional well-being of pupils as they return to school. Uh, and what we've done is we've worked with our local partners, including Compass Bulls and um, the CAMS provider, <clears throat> to make sure we put a range of support and training back in schools um, to just boost that ability to um, look after children's mental health issues and concerns. There is a flip side to this. Um, 
So we are we are concerned that those children who need specialist services are identified and get it. And children are back in school in huge numbers and the services we're providing additionally will remind schools and flow that through. So I'm I'm pleased children are back at school and I'm pleased <clears throat> that we can then keep our eye on those children and refer them through where needed. However, there is a flip side to this. Um, you, you know that many of our services and I, 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 we base all our services on relationship based practice. Indeed, most CAM services are about relational based practice. And what you have to remember through this period is that on the whole, children have spent a lot of time with their parents. And that's a great thing. So, so actually, there's a flip side of this that for many children, they'll remember COVID as that period of time they spent time at home with mum and dad. And that's a good thing. So we haven't seen services overwhelmed by um, children needing support um, and we are providing additional lower level support to make sure that where there are issues, children and young people can access online services. We've done whole school training, we're doing some more training. So we are, we are deliberately keeping our eye on this area. Okay, does that answer your question? Lindsay or have you got a further one? Um, no I, th I think that's that's good to hear and um, I do agree with Maggie that um, the one-to-one -one support and the relationship building is critical and I just hope that that capacity is within the schools. Um, however I, I am aware that you know some students do need uh, camp support and I understand that we are trying to get through those um, referrals as quickly as possible. Thank you. That, Thank you very much, Councillor. Chair, Chair, Chair that, that, that's my understanding as well. Um, those, those services, very sadly, um, have always been a little bit at the back of the queue in terms of specialist mental health teams and services. Um, and as Stuart said in his remarks, um, there are there are national issues with finding speedy access to specialist help when a child is in really serious distress, um, and the government and governments of all stamps, um, way back 25 years or more, have been aware that there is an issue with uh, the availability of services quickly and agile in an agile way when children need them, and somehow it seems to be hovering on the edge of, or sometimes placed into, the too hard box in terms of funding, not least. Um, but uh, the comfort I would give the committee is that the, the partners that sit around the partnership table in North Yorkshire are all very keenly aware and working very hard with uh, your provider services to make things easier to access and easier to signpost for children who may find their, their, themselves lost in the middle of a confusing system. And that, that's ongoing, but the commitment is very real. Thank you very much, Maggie. Can we turn now to Councillor uh, Stephanie Duckett with her question, please, Stephanie? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, a lot of it's been covered, actually, in what in uh, Maggie and Stuart's replies to, uh, to Lindsay's. Um, I was... So, Wanting to know if you know if there was anything particular in the uh, the board's um, you know that merited the uh, attention of us, uh, the board's attention, and um, what things you would like to see um, so that we can know we have a good quality service and all the support that we need. Bearing in mind, you know, we're never going to get everything we want there, but um, so we we know that we're doing everything we can to help these children, especially at this time. Um, I, I think it's possible, Chair, that, that, that Stuart, as the leader of the County Council branches of service, uh, would be better equipped to, to focus and answer on, on that question. What I would preface it with is to say that what I see is a growing determination on people's behalf to look not at just numbers or who's been through the door or how many children have done X, Y, or Z of a thing, but what difference has been made by the offer of services that those children have received. And that's very much how children and young people talk to us as a partnership when they come to meet with us. 
you know, don't tell me what you're doing and how many clinics there are. Tell me what difference it's going to make in my life. And it focuses professionals on the, on the answers to those questions. Stuart may have more to say, Chair. You, you have indicated, Stuart, that you wanted to speak, but I think that was in answer to an earlier question. But do you want to come in here just to add to the can, can I just for Council say, Duke? Yes, um, that, um, okay. the, the, comment, the comment that I have plenty to say is a rumour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, um, I am conscious that we have an update from the children's social care team coming and I, I don't want to steal some of um, what, what they are going to say. Um, okay. I, I think as a partnership and individually, we work very hard about the quality of service that we provide and um, regularly look at um, a triangulation of what our performance says. So our performance data, which you see and scrutinise as well, um, is very good. Um, we look at um, the um, quality of our practice and we measure quality by having a rating scale about the work we do and our quality ratings are always very good. Um, and we also do a lot of work about user feedback and um, the vast, vast majority of service users and families that use our services are very pleased with it. Um, so I think those those things should give us huge confidence. Um, I, I by no means am complacent and think that everything we do is fantastic. Of course it's not. But we have a again a very robust statutory complaints procedure where we take very seriously complaints that are made against us and where we can find the learning to improve the services that, that we have. Um, so I, 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 I think we also as a partnership and, and Maggie will, I think, if I come back to that, say that we have a very mature partnership that is open, frank and able to be self-critical and critical with each other without it being personal so you know yeah. i know that we yeah. are we challenge each other um, and that's a healthy thing to do there is nothing hidden in our partnership that we won't talk about thank you that's very true chair as, as, as both chair of the executive which i tend to undertake in a scrutiny mode um, and a scrutineer I, I can affirm what stuart's just said there is there is a, a professionally candid atmosphere uh, between partners, uh, including delivery partners who are commissioned by your CCGs to deliver health services, both physical and mental. Thank you. We'll go to the next question. Uh, Councillor Annabelle Wilkinson, please. Annabelle. Thank you, Chair. Um, Maggie, in your report, you state how um, the rise in crime is where some of the children are victims themselves and perpetrators of those crimes. And uh, during COVID, the initial lockdown, a lot of the crime figures went down because county lines were blocked and unable to function as smoothly as they normally or unfortunately do. Do you hope that those figures now, although they're going up a little bit, that we'll be a, we have the capacity to still support those young people and not allow the strength of hold that these people have on our young people? Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful, Councillor. One of the things that um, I, I would remark on is how uh, strong and committed the partnership is between uh, the three statutory bodies that have to be on it. The first is the County Council, the second is your CCGs, and the third is the Police Service. Mm. And uh, the Board, uh, in its previous uh, iteration and now the partnership, has, has been constantly fortunate in having uh, the presence of very senior police officers at the table. They don't delegate it downwards, they come themselves. And um, they are very aware, uh, North Yorkshire Police are very aware of the, the risks to do with county lines, given mm -hmm. that your county borders on some major conurbations like Bradford and Leeds. Um, and you also have access to port towns and port cities where county lines are also very lively. Um, my, my hope is that we are learning more and more and more about what the signs are that a child who's 
initially picked up and believed to have perpetrated the crime is actually a victim. Um, and I know that that's Annette Anderson and Alan Harders. They're the two senior police officers we have most to do with. That's mm -hmm. very much their hope as well, that down through the ranks in the police service, there is this notion that children who perpetrate are very often also themselves victims. Yeah. The, number, the numbers on the violent crime uh, stats have been taken away by uh, uh, working groups to do some digging. What do they mean? Is it the same children? Is it the same places? Um, is it the same catchment areas in the same schools? Um, how far are children known already to serve services um, and known to be at risk? So that work is coming back. Remember, this report was written covering the period of the first six months of the board's operation. So actually, since it was put to bed, you might say, um, a great deal more work has continued to be done. And I think that as we see numbers start to rise because people's front doors open again, um, services are on the case is what I would reflect back. Um, can you always, can you always talk to yourself um, being hurt or harmed or hurting or harming somebody else? No. Can you do your level best to make sure that those things don't happen? Absolutely. And that's the, that's the ethos of the services in North Yorkshire. Thank you, Maggie. And I know that the Youth Justice Board are very much um, in support of this as well, aren't they? So thank you. Your youth, thank you for... yeah, your, your, your youth Justice Services, uh, right, very rightly, have been uh, judged very positively indeed by Her Majesty's Inspector of Probation not that long ago. Um, and that's, that's very strongly multi-agency. They were set up to be multi-agency and youth offending teams and services have continued to do so um, against all the odds really, um, because many of the children who come into their clientele are also clients of other services, mental health teams, physical health teams, social care, um, are all very often involved. So you need to concentrate on those possibly top 100 children uh, with a particular keenness, and your youth justice team does that. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I've got chair, more chair, people chair. Ask, uh, sorry. Chair, if I may, I just just again to just to add to Can that. Can somebody please mute because we've got background noise. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, all... Just 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 to add to that, Chair. Um, I I have no doubt that through lockdown, the criminal exploitation of children has continued. Um, um, we've been very alive to that, so we have not stepped down any of our arrangements. Um, indeed. In it's interesting because uh, we have some very strong and robust multi-agency um, child exploitation arrangements, as you know, and subgroups uh, that run across the county. And actually, them being virtually has meant that more people have attended. Um, um, both um, Martin's here in the room, both myself and Martin have been able to get to some of those meetings and check how they're running and, on, and operating. And I think we have some of the most robust systems for identifying children, sharing information about perpetrators and then disrupting this um, as possible. Um, we're, we're not complacent again. We are constantly looking to review and improve this. It's important we try to keep a step, a step ahead of some of these criminal gangs who will be looking for those gaps and opportunities. So that is robust and still happening. And again, I won't steal Martin's funder um, but he will talk about how we have maintained our focus on children and meeting them and seeing them um, as we work through. So I, I can provide some assurance. And then the last point about the Youth Offending Board, I am delighted with the inspection outcome. And you, you, you know, Councillor Wilkinson, because you've attended some of those. Mm. Um, um, I, I take that very seriously and chair that partnership as well and provide that linkage then back to the wider safeguarding as well. So we again, we work hard to make sure that no service operates in a vacuum, that they are all connected because children don't live in services. And it's for us to make sure we all work together to do the right thing for them, no matter what their issues are. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I've got four more people wanting to speak, and this is the order that I had them in. So, Councillor Richard Musgrove, please. Richard, can you put your question? Richard, can you hear us? I'll come back to you. 
I'll pass on to Steve Maltby, who was the primary school representative, who wanted to ask a question, please, Steve. Can you unmute yourself? Sorry, members, okay? Chairman, I'll come back to both of those if they yeah, do Chairman, manage to... Sorry. It's Ray, Ray Busby here. Just from my records, I've been able to try and keep a, a reasonable tally of yeah. who wants to speak. I think it might be councillor, councillor's man and then yes, Quinn. Yes, I've got man down and I've got councillor Quinn. Okay, But, uh, Thank but you. Richard Musgrave asked, was quite early on wanting to ask a question, as was Steve Maltby. I think okay. Councillor Mosgrave might have left the meeting, but I'm not That's too sure fine. about uh, Stephen. OK, right, we'll go on to Councillor John Mann then. Sorry about that. I'm just going by the order. Oh, Councilor thank you, Mann. Chair. Uh, thank John. you very much. Yes, uh, Councillor John Mann representing Harrogate Central. I finally got my mute button to work, so apologies for that All earlier. Right. Um, I just wanted to thank Maggie for an excellent uh, and very thorough report, if I may. Um, very interesting indeed. I was just interested in how the partnership had worked uh, during the last few months, especially during the sort of um, the deepest part of, of, of the lockdown in April and May. Um, uh, Stuart's touched on it already. Obviously, children really appreciate being with their parents. I think that's hugely beneficial to them. Um, but, but I was just wondering how lockdown had um, affected the work of the, the partnership and the, the safeguarding teams and whether Maggie would revisit any um, paragraphs or pages of her report in the light of our collective experiences during lockdown, bearing in mind, I think, that the report was signed off at the end of the end of March. Um, yeah, Chair, that, that's a very useful question. Thank you, Councillor. Um, it, this report was signed off at the end of March and, and the, the pandemic was only just starting to emerge as a, a really serious consideration at that time. Um, since then, what uh, James and the admin team, the business team, have managed to do is, first of all, to get me in as, a, as an observer or a participant observer every subgroup uh, of the partnership, uh, apart from the NACES, and they are coming up this autumn. Um, and I have been able to feed back to their chairs and members that I'm assured that they are both following their terms of reference and compliant with Working Together 2018. We've also managed to keep in place in the diary um, all of our executive meetings. Um, they've, they've happened by Skype or by Teams, um, and they have happened very usefully and very um, routinely in an awful lot of ways. The business is the business. There is always an item on how well things are going uh, with regards to the pandemic. But there are then reports back from the chairs of subgroups and the chairs of local safeguarding partnerships um, and the chairs of relevant agency bodies. Um, and there are discussions by the executive as to where we should be trying to move the agenda next. Um, and what my business as scrutineer should look like as I go away from an executive meeting or away from a subgroup meeting. Um, so I'm, I'm um, delighted to report to, to members that um, things have not broken stride. We have all sat at our desks in our various living rooms or offices, interrupted by pussycats or dogs or children variously or by nobody, um, and the business has continued. Um, and a mark of the way that the county has dealt with how well its children and young people are faring is that that business has continued and people have continued to hold each other to account. Um, I would reflect, having done all of my work since March um, online, that whilst it's a very efficient and useful environment, it's also not very human. Uh, and what people are missing is the contact. The, the in the office conversations, the are you going out to get a sandwich, I'll come with you conversations that take place in an ordinary workplace every day. Um, it's that contact and that continued inter interaction with each other that people miss. And when you're wall to wall, back to back on meetings, you also don't build into your diary enough time to pick up the business that the meeting you just came out of has generated. So if anything, people are working harder and longer. 
and it will make them tired. So everybody needs to look out for everybody, really. Um, and I know your schools will be feeling it, and Amanda will want to talk to you about that when it's her turn on this agenda. But my assurance is that business has not broken stride in North Yorkshire. Um, and that's, that's to their credit. That's to the credit of the partners because it's been a busy time. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, John, for your question. Can I pass to Councillor Gillian Quinn now, please? Gillian? Hi, thank you very much indeed. I, I just would just wondered how long on average from the sort of point of need do young people have to wait for an intervention, either a soft intervention or for an onward referral to CAMS? Um, I'm not sure that I can answer that question. I would think there will be children, particularly in current circumstances, for whom that need of pastoral support and a kindly adult will have been heightened. But there will also, as Stuart said previously, be children who have relished family time and time at home and different ways of working and different ways of learning. Um, and may actually come back into school or back into society and back into their community more robust and happier than they were before. The child who hasn't had a great deal of attention or the child who is autistic and finds big crowds and big classrooms difficult to deal with may well have actually had a more settled period during lockdown than we might imagine. Not and In just the same way as when you've met an adult, you've met one adult. When you've met a child, you've met one child, um, and teachers and others appreciate that and, and work in nuanced ways um, because it's their professional duty and their professional skill to do so. Um, Stuart may have other things to reflect on, uh, Councillor. I'll hand you back. Yes, thank you, Chen. If I may, is that is that okay? We um, you, Stuart. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a really good question. It's actually really difficult for me to answer. Um, and it, and, no, no, that's fine. It's a good <laughs> question. And, and it's probably something we want to explore in the future, actually, because and, and what I mean by that is it's complicated by the fact that we don't have a single provider of CAM services across mm -hmm. the county. It is different providers depending which part of the county you live in. So some of it is provided through CHU as a contract to the three merged CCGs, which covers um, a good part of the county, but then the um, west of the county is covered through a different um, arrangement because that's covered through um, Bradford, Airedale and um, yes. Trust. So, so it's a difficult question for us to give and I, I, I'm quite, and it's also not services provided by the local authority, of course, they're provided yes and commissioned by the CCGs. So this, this may be a good thing to come back at at some point over the year as a, 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 an inquiry to look at actually. And, okay. and it's also difficult for me to answer just because of lockdown and what's been happening in the last six months has made it different to normal. So I, I do think it's worth us coming back to and exploring. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Members, I can't see any more hands. Um, anyone else want to ask a question of Maggie? I'm not sure how much time she had left. I know she had to move to another meeting because 5B of this part is, is going to be taken by James Parks. Are there any other questions for Maggie? Can I just say as chairman, thank you very much for a very, very comprehensive report. Um, as we say, we are an outstanding service, but we feel sometimes quite critical when we draw questions to you. But I think your role has completely changed from what your predecessor was. Um, I know because I'm part, as other members are, of some of the subgroups, and we are meeting. I've had two virtual meetings since the lockdown with COVID. Um, we have close links with that, and it involves our schools as well. And I think under difficult times, we are progressing well. And regarding crime, I think with my area, we have unlocked and achieved a lot uh, within COVID, especially with our young children and county lines. But thank you, Maggie. Um, thank you to our director for following through as well, and James. And members, if that's all on that section, 
Can we move to 5B, which is the annual report? Uh, child excuse death. Me. Sorry, excuse Maggie. Me. Sorry, Luke. It's, 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 yeah, I, 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 have, I have time to give you simply an introductory remark or two, if that's all right. Um, I'm really sorry about this morning. Um, uh, and I'm sure that Stuart and James can take you through the detail because we've poured over this as a partnership in great detail. Um, my introductory remarks would simply be to remind everybody that this is a shared child death overview panel yes, with your yes, neighbours yes. in the city of York. Um, and therefore, that the numbers are not North Yorkshire only. Um, and I know that, that, that this, this panel deals with some of the hardest things that any partnership has to discuss, whether it's an expected death of a child with serious illness or injury or extreme prematurity, or whether very sadly it's an unexpected death uh, by suicide or other means. It's chaired extremely professionally. Uh, people are very committed to its agendas, um, which are uh, got through with great skill and organisation. Um, it's a credit to Ali Furby from your officer team that this partnership is so well supported um, and it deals with some very, very difficult and tragic business in the most professional and sensitive way. Um, so I think you can be assured that if you're comfortable with allowing James and Stuart to pick up on, on, the, on the, the further detail, I, I will say thank you very much indeed for your kind remarks to me. Uh, I hope your meeting continues to be successful this morning and I look forward to seeing you all in person when we can. Thank you very much. Right, before you just leave, Maggie, one of our councillors, Councillor Jill, Gillian Quinn, just wanted to come back. Was this with regard to the first part, Councillor Quinn, or is it the second? Sorry, you're on mute, mute. Sorry, sorry, Councillor Jefferson. It was about actually what, what once Maggie had finished, we needed to go back to item one to approve the yes, minutes. Yes, yes. Well, okay. what I will actually do, what I'll actually do, Councillor Quinn, is finish the 5B, as I said, right. and then go back. Is that OK? Yes, of course it is. That's fine. OK. Thank you once again, Maggie, for coming to our meeting. Um, albeit we couldn't see you for the whole of the meeting, but thank you very much for all the questions <laughs> and the answers that you, you've, uh, you've posed to us as well, really, because I think we're scrutinising you, but you're also scrutinising us as well. We have thank our you. part to play. Thank you very much. Thank so we'll move on to thank the, you very the much second part. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. James, are you going to do an overview of this following yes. Maggie's introduction? Yeah. Thank Definitely. you very much. Um, so, uh, good morning, uh, members. Um, uh, I'll provide just a brief um, summary and uh, take the assumption that you've um, had the opportunity to read the uh, annual report for uh, the child death. As Maggie says, this is an annual report that covers North Yorkshire and the city of York. Um, and um, I have the, the, the privilege, really, of, uh, of managing um, the, the child overview uh, process within North Yorkshire and York. And, and we take great care um, at, at doing so. Um, just to, to give you some highlights, really, in terms of um, you'll see within the, the reporting year, we had 33 deaths of, of children um, and young people um, uh, who uh, sadly died within um, the county and the city. Um, it's of note to say that the most at risk um, individuals um, within our population um, are those at the under, uh, under ones um, and um, primarily within that first 27 days of, of a, a child being uh, born. Um, we ha have um, both expected and um, what we call unexpected death. So uh, an expected death may be due to a, a, a long term illness or a child's um, life expectancy going to be shorter than um, than, than the most. Um, and then unexpected uh, child deaths, um, either car uh, fatalities, um, incidents um, or, or in some cases a, a child suicide. Um, and um, we treat each and every case, as Maggie mentioned, with the utmost care and respect when we're um, working in those initial sort of hours after a child death, all the way through um, the child death review process, um, up until um, we, we review um, the cases anonymously uh, to look at uh, identifiable factors and modifiable factors that we can put in place to try to, to learn from these uh, sad cases. Um, 
as I, as I mentioned, that perinatal and, and neonatal um, events is is the kind of the the, the um, largest number of of children, um, which is generally linked um, around sort of that um, prematurity um, of of those cases. Um, within this reporting period, we have reviewed seven um, suicides uh, which have been sadly um, linked to children. Um, these seven suicides didn't take place just in this um, last financial year. Um, the way that um, child death review, we, we, we await post-mortem results, um, inquests, um, which can take some, some months and, uh, and years um, to, um, to conclude. So um, we have to obviously give due course to, um, to those processes before um, concluding that particular review. Um, and um, I think with the current um, kind of COVID uh, pandemic issues that we've been seeing, um, that some of those um, inquests and um, will be delayed or have been delayed. Um, so we may see a slight delay in information coming back through um, from from those coroner uh, officers. Um, and then really um, picking up on some of the areas of, of, of work that the, the child death overview uh, panel um, are looking at. So this is around um, unsafe sleeping arrangements um, and suicide um, prevention. And we're working with a variety of different colleagues on both of those subject matters. Um, and um, I, I'm sure you may have some questions that will be poignant to, to both of those, those areas that I'm, I'm more than happy to, to, to answer. Um, but I would just like to stress um, my thanks to um, the Child Death um, Overview Panel, uh, which is chaired um, um, fantastically well uh, by one of our um, public health nurses um, over in York, um, and also um, administered on a day-to-day -day basis by um, by Ali, as Maggie mentioned, who does a, a sterling job um, at, uh, at providing support to us all um, within the, the process. Um, so happy to take uh, any questions that members might have. Members, have we any questions, please? I've got there's a hand gone up, two hands. Um, Councillor Quinn, have you got a question or is your hand from the previous time? Sorry, it's from the previous time. I can't, I can't, I can't lower it. Sorry, don't worry, don't worry. Um, the first one I'm trying to locate. I can't see your face, I'm sorry. I've got another hand up who wants to ask a question. Can you identify yourself, please, members? Um, so it's, it's Tom Cavill Taylor here. I put oh, my hand up. Good morning, Tom. Thank you. Um, Tom is our parent representative, governor representative. So this isn't really uh, a question. I don't want to distract the meeting at all. But before you publish this report, can I just suggest you have a quick relook at table one there? Because I think. City of York and North Yorkshire columns are the wrong way round. So I don't want to distract the meeting, but before this gets published, just check because the data is inconsistent with all the other graphs. So it's just a really a typo. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll make a note of that. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Annabelle Wilkinson. Annabelle. Thank you, Chair. Um, James, some of those, the practitioners, that have to deal with those very difficult questions. Do you feel there's enough support for them, enough training? Are you happy with that? Um, yeah, so in terms of um, training for CDOT generally, um, as a partnership, um, we um, provide, um, uh, provide CDOT uh, training to understand those sorts of processes um, that um, instigate. And it's a bit, I suppose, like first aid, really. It's one of those things that um, you, you, you do and you hope you never need to, um, to kind of um, enact um, as part of um, the, the, the role of, of CDOC we do um, take that support and well-being of staff very seriously and we, we, we speak to a variety of agencies so I know for, for a fact through the through the local authority um, through our um, health colleagues in terms of that trauma-informed practice um, that, um, that staff are, uh, are trained in as part of um, social work training uh, health training police training there are um, sort of robust uh, processes um, in terms of dealing with trauma, dealing with uh, adverse um, effects. Um, and then I suppose most importantly, the ability to do the debrief after a particular incident. And um, when I chair um, those meetings, um, initially after within 72 hours of a, a child death, we take um, time within that meeting to reflect on the support that 
each individual member of staff, um, be it the uh, frontline ambulance crew that were uh, attending that incident, um, and uh, ensure that they have got the most appropriate support um, for for their well-being. And I'm um, assured to say that in in all cases that that is the case. That staff report that they have access um, and actively sort of take part in in debrief sessions with uh, with supervisors and uh, superiors within their uh, relevant agencies. Um, so yes, I think that the training is available, um, it is accessed, and we've just seen, and again within the virtual realms, um, our CDOC uh, training has been accessed um, by significantly more people, and I think that's a, a positive um, in terms of um, people's understanding and knowledge um, in case they uh, are needed to, to kind of intervene in those particular areas. Thank you, James. It's just because the unsafe sleeping figures, the, the conversations that have had to be had there um, are with some of the most vulnerable families themselves, aren't they? Or, um, so that's why I just wanted to ask that. Thank you. Yeah. Members, are there any other questions for James? Thank you. Can't see anyone else. Right. Um, my Chair, just, just one. Sorry. May I ask a question? Yeah, sorry. Um, Councillor Mann, yes, you can. Yeah, sorry. Thought, yeah, thank you. Apologies. Um, I was we just missed you on the first trench. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, um, yeah. go no, ahead, please. Thank no, you. Sorry, Chair. Um, I was interested in the, the, the suicide figure, which you think, I think you said from memory was seven. Um, looking at the... Um, uh, the section six, what has CDOP achieved in 2019-20, which is obviously a lot, um, in, in relation to the second priority which you've reported on, it says that um, over recent years the COPD has seen uh, a number of children who have taken their own lives sadly increase. Each and every death has had an impact, uh, etc. Um, I was just wondering, obviously we're all concerned about this uh, increasing trend. I was just wondering if it was linked to the increasing use, and I think addiction in some cases, to social media. Um, and I just wondered if, if, if the panel had a view on this, and uh, if that was the case, if we did think there was a link, what could we, as a as councillors and as, as a collective team, and what, what do you think um, society w without broadening it too too much what do you think we could do about it Please. um yeah that's really um really important point and i, I think um having um been involved in uh, and engaged with with each and every one of these deaths there's a variety of different reasons um that um that young people um, have unfortunately taken their own life um, i think in some cases those reasons are unknown um and um and sadly um, we probably will never um, fully understand uh, the reason um, that that individual child um, has taken their, their own life. Um, I think in terms of the work that, that CDOP is doing, we're doing some significant work with our partners um, across York and North Yorkshire um, around suicide uh, prevention. I think social media, um, as with um, a lot of um, aspects of life, will have an impact um, on on uh, on children and young people both in a positive way um, but some sadly um, in a in a negative way um, it's about i think having those open and honest uh, conversations with with children and young people um, it, it's great to to see at the moment in terms of education the um the the sex uh, relationships in education uh, being uh, mandated within within um, secondary and, and primary um, and having the ability to have open and frank conversations around social, emotional, mental health. And we're seeing a significant, as Stuart um, uh, said earlier, in terms of the investment into um, support services we see in North Yorkshire um, through, through Compass. Uh, we've got resources um, linked to uh, Cooth, which is an online um, provision that young people can, can access. Um, and also the GoTo website, which is um, a, a new website that's been developed in partnership with our health colleagues. To try and make sure that children and young people have um, the access to the positive information and, and support services uh, that they that they can access. Um, and there's some fantastic um, charities out there who are doing some amazing work in terms of um, trying to 
um, have the conversation um, about, particularly around suicide. It's an area that a lot of people will shy away from um, and, and not um, sort of uh, discuss in, in public. Um, and I think I've seen over the last sort of uh, two to three years um, much more conversation around suicide prevention. We've seen an increase um, in, in, in terms of literature and materials that we are um, signposting and sharing. Um, we've introduced a um, self-harm and suicide ideology pathway, uh, which has been a, a welcomed resource for both teachers, uh, health professionals and the local authority staff as a way of navigating and understanding that complex um, mental health uh, picture, as, as Stuart described, where we've got a number of different organisations uh, providing different services across uh, across the county. Um, it is something that we, as we, as you say, is an ongoing um, action within within CDOP, and we have got a um, a task and finish group uh, that is uh, working particularly to try and understand um, a little bit more about, um, particularly around youth suicide, um, understanding. Um, the reasons uh, and primarily identifying those sorts of gaps in service or gaps in understanding um, and, uh, and we will continue um, to do that and I'm personally uh, very passionate about um, suicide prevention and, and linking into some national uh, forthcoming conferences that we can bring sort of learn from other areas and bring that into uh, our work in North Yorkshire. Right. Uh, thank you, thank you Chair. Uh, Members, I've got an indication from Councillor Plant. Joe, do you want to ask a question? Um, thank you, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, and can I just place on record uh, my thanks and appreciation for everybody who works in young people's services. Um, they're doing, doing some fantastic work and it's much appreciated by many people. So I'd like to say a big thank you to everybody involved. Um, well, uh, the question um, I'd like to ask is your CDOP priorities 2020, 2021, 7.1. Um, where are we with that? And could you give us a bit more information on it? There's bullet points there, but it would be useful to understand where you are with your priorities at the moment. And because of where we are with COVID-19, has that been put back? Are we still uh, planning to go ahead with it? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Joe, for your, your question. And I'll, I'll take um, sort of each of the four uh, priorities and just give you a summary of, of where we're at with that particular piece of work. Um, I think it's just important to know, obviously, with COVID, um, we um, fortunately um, have not seen um, any COVID related um, deaths within North Yorkshire and York. And, and, um, and nationally, I think we um, children and young people have been um, fortunately, um, not as affected in terms of the death rate as we have seen, particularly in our adult population. Um, but it is something that we do monitor um, and uh, report to um, our national colleagues um, on each and every case that we, we do get in. So just looking at the first um, priority area is looking at um, the safe sleep um, advice. Um, and as I said um, in my introduction, in terms of um, Safe sleep is a priority for, for us, and we have seen a number of um, deaths that have occurred due to um, either overlay um, or, or unsafe sleeping arrangements. Um, we have um, instigated a, a task and finish group that is looking particularly at that issue, um, and um, they are reviewing, um, doing an audit work of, of what literature and information our colleagues send um, to uh, newborn uh, or new uh, new parents of, of newborn babies. Um, that information um, I know um, is, is underway and we have um, reviewed and amended some of the uh, documentation that we um, we send out, uh, I say we, the collective we, in terms of our health colleagues um, into um, in Harrogate Trust and, and, and York Maternity Trust um, who deliver those sorts of services. Um, we use national um, literature, which is um, evidence based, um, and um, we are constantly looking at new ways to try and get those messages. Um, I know from having children myself and, and, and colleagues uh, speaking of having children sort of 10, 20 years ago when safe sleep messages were um, very much in the, the media attention. Um, there are a number of avenues that we are looking to try and make sure that we are getting that information um, across the families in the most appropriate way and, and just by having a leaflet um, is not necessarily just that way so we're looking at other uh, sort of media um, messaging 
um, other um, accessibility in, in additional uh, additional languages as well for those families where um, English isn't their first language. Um, so there is a task and finish group, um, as I say, uh, being set up, um, and that is, um, I think it's into its second um, second meeting, um, and that has a variety of different uh, partners um, around the table. Um, in terms of the panel um, looking out for research, um, in terms of um, the suicide, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a lot of work at the moment going on um, around, particularly around suicide prevention. Um, and um, we are and, and do look at each individual case to see if there are um, modifiable factors um, that can be put in place. Um, it's fair to say a number of the, the, the suicides, particularly um, that we've seen, um, have not been engaged or have had no involvement with um, sort of statutory services. So these are children and young people out in our communities who haven't necessarily come to the attention of, um, of safeguarding services or, or early help. Services. Um, so we need to understand a little bit more about that and is there an opportunity that we can engage with those children through other um, networks, through education and, and social groups uh, to try and get those messages um, across. Um, the third is looking at um, sort of the, the audits uh, we'll, we'll be uh, recommending. So that's the information that from the, the safe sleep and through the suicide work um, how we will understand and, and, and make sure that CEDOC holds all agencies to account to, to get the um, suppose to get the learning into into practice um, and making sure that people are uh, are, are, are learning from um, previous cases and um, hopefully to prevent um, future deaths. Um, and the direct link, as, as, as we said, um, around COVID, um, we haven't seen um, any um, direct links uh, with any of the cases that we um, we have. Um, and I would hope, touch wood, that we will not see um, going forward. And uh, I think the national number of children who've been um, uh, directly affected by COVID um, is less than 10 um, nationally. Uh, I, I don't know the exact figure at the moment, but um, the, the last one I had was around eight children um, had, uh, had died where COVID um, infection had been um, present, but that might be due to other medical complications that they um, have had and not necessarily just solely um, around COVID. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of an overview in terms of where we're, where we're at. Um, as I say, um, we, we constantly review um, all child deaths um, and um, where our priorities will focus on some areas each individual case will have particular um, learning points that we will work with our partners to um, to try and overcome. Um, thank you. Uh, can I come back, Chair, please? Yes, you've got your hand up, Council yeah. Plan. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, James, uh, for that uh, reply, um, much appreciated. Um, it's probably asking how long a piece of string is, but have you got any idea when the audits will uh, be finalised, please? Um, off the top of my head, um, I can't exactly remember the exact dates, but I know we have a uh, our next overview um, panel will be coming up um, just shortly before Christmas. Um, so there will be regular updates in terms of, um, uh, of that. So I, I, I can take that back and come back to you, but I would imagine it would be um, a, 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 that kind of a December meeting of, of the child death overview panel. That answer your question, Councillor Plant. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. I mean, by December, we may get a much fuller figure as well. Although, as you quite rightly say, we haven't or know of any deaths with children of COVID, but there always is the ongoing things with this virus, as you will be aware with polio, the offshoots of that, and other pandemics. So we hope and pray that nothing comes of that with our young people as well. Thank you very much, James, for your report. Very, very well received. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, can we please go back to item one with apologies for why we missed it. I think it was because we were conscious of, of starting the meeting, uh, but we have to approve the minutes of the meeting of our committee, which took place on Friday the 28th of February, which are on pages four to seven of your agenda. Um, I was not at the meeting because I had another one to attend and so I gave apologies. 
So I'll refer to Councillor Gillian Quinn, the Vice Chair, just to uh, go through and ask for a proposal and a seconder. Councillor Quinn, please. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Um, members, could I ask that you know you have got have you got any comments on the on the on the minutes at all? And and if then nobody has any comments, could I ask for a proposal and a seconder? Cliff Lund, I'll propose it. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have a seconder? Councillor Wilkinson, a seconder. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Thank you very much. So we'll move on now to item six, which is the Children and Families COVID update, uh, which we have presenting Martin Kelly, our Assistant Director for Children's and Family, and Daniel Johnson, Head of Safeguarding Children and Families. OK. I'm conscious of time, but Ray, we think we're still all right with this. I know Councillor Plant drew the, drew the attention of what happened at one of the area committees, but I presume because we have an ongoing item of, you know, with time that we're OK, are we? Uh, we are, Chairman. This is Ray Busby speaking. Yes, we're fine for chair uh, for time, Chair. That's fine. The problem Joe referred to, one. yeah, the, okay. the problem Joe referred to is when we were trying to when one live broadcast was following another. That's not yeah. the case today. This is the only meeting being live broadcast. So the time's yours, Chairman. I've checked with some of the officers and uh, the officers are OK, uh, even though we're slightly overrunning. But I think you're right, Chairman. We now turn to, to item six. Yeah. And I think we're going to have a slide uh, presentation with that, are we, Ray? Yeah, I'll allow to Martin to, to introduce the item yes. and I just need the... Uh, the green for go and I'll upload the slides so that uh, all the members of the committee can see them chairman. Thank you very much I'll hand over to Martin thank you very much. Thank you chair so um, this is just a, um, a very high level update really in terms of what's been going on across children and families um, since early March since um, since the lockdown and just prior to lockdown um, in terms of protecting children so it really is high level I'm happy to take any questions about the slides or um, any other questions that, that um, perhaps aren't on the slides. Uh, are you happy to, to just upload them? Yeah, I'll okay. upload them now, Chairman. Just bear with me. They should be coming into view now. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ray. They're very, very much in view. Can everyone see them? Are we OK? Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK, so if we can just move on to slide one, please, Ray. So as I, as I said, this is really a, a very high level um, overview. So right at the beginning of, of lockdown, um, it's worth saying that the government introduced a, a range of temporary regulations, um, so a change in regulations that enabled the local authority uh, or all local authorities to respond urgently and flexibly to issues. Um, so Danielle, later on in the slides, will just take us through some of those regulations and how North Yorkshire has responded. Um, they, they, the national change in regulations did come under some uh, some degree of criticism um, and some concern that we weren't uh, that, that 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 was a, um, a a risky thing to do if you if you like. Um, we certainly took the view that we would only use them if, if absolutely necessary and actually take the view that it was the right thing for the government to do in terms of introducing emergency legislation, given we didn't know at that time how serious an, um, an issue we were dealing with. Um, so we very quickly established an emergency planning group um, which met daily across children and families. Um, we rapidly established within a matter of um, the first week or two um, at looking at, at every single case that we were dealing with right across children and families from early help, all social work, youth justice, leaving care and all of our placements. So that that rag rated effectively over 4000 cases um, and rag rating to really look at whether we needed to, to visit families and children virtually, whether we needed to take a blended approach or whether we needed to make sure that um, certain children were seen on a face to face basis. Um, I think we've, we've got there and this is, is fairly um, the, the 4000 cases that were were, were rag rated. Um, we, we saw the majority of our child protection um, cases in every case sort of face to face. So we've, we've, since since lockdown, we've done over five and a half thousand visits. 
about 99% of those children have all been seen face to face. So in many ways, it's been business as usual across children and families. In some cases, we've had to use um, PPE, a range of different ways to make sure that we get into family households. But the majority of that business has, has all the way through this process has been um, been done as, as normal. Um, we were planning for the worst, but hoping for the best. So as I say, we, we looked at every uh, issue in terms of using emergency legislation if needs to, if we needed to. Um, we were aware that we might lose a number of social workers either through um, through shielding or uh, getting COVID or having people within their family that had COVID. So we needed to think about how we would continue to, to, um, to deliver the service. Um, the other important thing, and I think it's been recognised and discussed today, is that social work uh, is in itself a, um, you, you're working with trauma on a daily basis. In terms of the support for, for our um, our workforce, it was incredibly important that we thought about uh, how we support them when they weren't coming into their usual offices and, and meeting with each other. So we created a, a news bulletin which has been extremely well received. We've had a number of um, fairly large scale events um, uh, using the, the social media, all of which have been exceptionally well received and um, a lot of, of, of very good feedback from, from staff in terms of how they felt uh, supported. Um, We've developed a, a single point of information again across the workforce. There's an enormous amount of information coming from government and elsewhere at the beginning of the pandemic. And we need to make sure that we work through that um, uh, that legislation changes in ways of working to make sure that we uh, that, that our part of the workforce understood their their part in that. Um, PPE was a big issue. It's a big concern um, right at the beginning. I think the local authority has done a tremendous job with partners at making sure that we were able to address that issue quickly. Um, so we were able to um, to source PPE um, and not a lot of it has, has been used for children and families, but it was absolutely necessary in terms of developing, developing confidence in the system. Family time was a big issue for us. So young people that are placed away from their, their families um, either have court order contact or other arrangements in terms of visiting families. And almost all of that um, went virtual overnight. So children that were meeting with their families, but through fairly creative methods um, using Zoom and all sorts of other uh, social media approaches. Um, and we saw a, a, an early reduction, as did every local authority in the country, in the number of contacts and referrals that were coming to us. And that's, that was no surprise, given the fact that obviously we had closure of schools and uh, less services, less organisations and agencies seeing children. Um, it was really important that we kept in touch with some of our most vulnerable and certainly our care leavers. We had some great donations from the likes of Amazon, who, who donated about, uh, I think it was 70 uh, headphones and speakers. We had some great generosity across um, a number of members who contributed to us developing goodie bags and um, putting together some goodie bags. And I know a couple of members um, on this, this uh, in this meeting of, of, were also very, very much part of, of putting those bags together. So every even person um, and every care leaver received a, a goodie bag with things to do um, and uh, just a, a nice message to say that we were we were thinking about them. Um, lots of things like cards and flowers sent to care leavers. So just really important that we we kept them in mind. Um, if it's OK, Chair, I'll, I'll probably go through all of the slides rather than ask questions around each one, um, if that's OK with you. I think that was a yes, although you're on. Yes, it was a yes. Sorry, that Fantastic. was a yes. Sorry, thank you. Um, so moving on sort of towards um, uh, moving on in the, the pandemic, so certainly mid-May and, and later, we established a, a recovery planning group. So it was it was important for us, especially for those children who weren't meeting their families, um, even at the, perhaps some of the, the height of the pandemic, um, for us to think about how we could safely reintroduce the um, uh, those things. So fam certainly family time was very important for us. I think we were probably one of the the first nationally really to, to start to put that on the table as being a, an issue that we felt um, face to face family time was was important. Enormous amount of work done in the background to get that right, to make sure that people felt confident in doing so, in, in, in uh, bringing families together along with their children. Um, a lot of work done in the background around buildings and making sure buildings were safe and lots of colleagues involved right across um, the corporate part of the organisation that supported that. But we very quickly got back here, back to um, ensuring that children could meet with their, their families and some very, very happy faces for many young people. 
Um, we certainly developed early on uh, some issues around understanding there was going to be a lot of, or there was going to be some um, issues of hidden harm. So um, the usual reporting mechanisms, such as children going to school, just weren't um, weren't there. So we needed to understand how could we get the message out across our partners, um, across the public, um, and perhaps neighbours to, to report things that were were unusual. Um, so we uh, don't usually go looking for for work. Um, you know, it normally comes to us. Um, we have plenty of contacts in terms of concerns for children. We need to think about ways of getting into communities and we put together a very quickly a multi-agency partnership group that established better raise, uh, awareness raising in terms of, of those issues. Um, we, we saw early on, and I think it's probably been discussed earlier, the, the early indications nationally of some increased non-accidental injuries. And with those non-accidental non -accidental injuries, we saw certainly some more serious implications than, than and, and serious injuries than we um, we would ordinarily see, and perhaps not with not always with families that we would ordinarily expect to see those uh, those injuries. So, some of those issues are about the fact that um, you know new babies, new new families, new parents, um, perhaps weren't having the contact with grandparents and all those people that would normally come into the household and ensure that um, new parents were able to um, to, to look after their, their vulnerable baby. Um, we need to look at vulnerable learners. Um, it became an absolute priority. It became a national priority of the government. Um, so we saw uh, fairly rapidly a, a fairly uh, good attendance in terms of, of um, children who were vulnerable learners. Um, we created a very quickly a buddy scheme using our early help service. So those that were staying with foster carers who were perhaps shielding, we created buddies who could just keep in contact with them, spend an hour on, on um, social media and help them do some work, some education work and just give uh, foster carers a bit of time out. Um, so we we, started, we created a, not, a lot of new services very quickly um, that allowed us to, to, to be fairly flexible. Um, talked about family time and we developed new services such as streets ahead so we knew that it was going to be there was going to, going to be an issue around uh, certainly teenagers perhaps struggling with some of the uh, the lockdown um, meeting on street corners perhaps getting involved in taking uh, drugs that they wouldn't ordinarily take all those sorts of issues so we we developed a service called streets ahead um, in some of our uh, key areas which is a detached youth work project um, and that was done alongside other colleagues um, within some of the voluntary sector providers. Um, moving on towards sort of later towards August, um, so we were, we've been up to right across the, the 4,000 visits at that point and we've probably been around about 10,000 visits now. Um, on the whole around 97% face to face across what we call child in need. Um, a little lower with looks after children, but we would expect that given that, that those looks after children on the whole are placed with foster carers and families and therefore are safe. So lots of visits and virtually um, we created lots of new ways of working with children. So, you know, the, the social workers going out and just doing um, a walk um, rather than just going and spending some time in the, the home. Um, we had some a fairly imaginative child protection visits that had to be done virtually where the social worker had asked the young person to take um, you know the, the the mobile phone around the house so that we could see different parts of the house and make sure that the, the house was safe um, so some real imaginative imaginative work um, there's been a, a gradual increase um, of looked after children certainly nothing like what other local authorities have seen I think it's really important that our practice model across North Yorkshire children and families is about making sure that we use family networks, grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, to make sure that we create safety for children um, and all overnight some of those safety uh, networks um, weren't available, especially um, grandparents. So as a result, we saw a, a, a small um, increase in, in looks after children and we're starting to see um, at that position um, certainly settle and, and go in the opposite direction. Uh, contacts and referrals started to gradually return to normal. We would expect during the summer holidays that they would be about 40% down um, once schools close, but actually we started to see those go to normal during the school holidays and perhaps more contacts from, uh, from the police and other agencies. Um, as I say, family time by that time had returned to normal. 
uh, still continue to do a blended approach and we're doing a, a project um, uh, supported by the Department for Education to look at how we can have a much more blended approach for family time in a place like North Yorkshire, which is such a large authority. We'd often had issues prior to lockdown um, with often um, you know, course suggesting that, that a baby would have contact with one or two parents um, for a couple of hours every single day and the baby is traveling right across the county. So actually this has really created some opportunity for us to think about much more blended approaches. We did some great work around um, for those of you, uh, those of you that might be aware of, of signs of safety and, uh, and our approach using words and pictures with young people around some of the anxieties that they may have about either returning to school or why they weren't going to school. So we saw some great examples of work um, just helping young people um, understand the story of what was going on in the pandemic. I think it was really important. We've talked earlier on about mental health. It was really important for us that we don't or didn't over pathologize the issues for, for mental health and, and children around the pandemic. I think Stuart's mentioned that for some children, it's actually been uh, in many ways very helpful. But it's also important to recognize that children are incredibly resilient and bounce back very quickly, unlike perhaps the way some adults. Um, so in the main, we've delivered um, business as usual. And then we moved to September and the, the the sort of new wave. Um, we've still got the the the, uh, the planning group, but it's moved to a pandemic management group, given the fact that we'll continue to deal with these issues for uh, at least several months. Um, it becomes more complicated as we go down to local lockdown areas. So we need to think about issues of where a, a, an area such as Liverpool or Manchester go into a local lockdown. If we've got children that are placed in those areas with family, um, how do we do things like family time when when households um, uh, can't visit um, each other? So some of those issues we just had to work through. Um, we're pragmatic in terms of making sure that on the whole we work with what we call primary legislation um, and primary legislation really is making sure that we we do uh, our business as best as we can as usual, um, given the fact that some of the lockdown issues are secondary legislation. Um, primary legislation in terms of child protection will always be uh, at the forefront of our thinking. Um, we've got our contacts have, have uh, returned to normal, but with higher complexity. So what we are seeing is the, the number of contacts coming into our our front door are higher, but um, the the sorry about the same, but the, the higher going into social care. So there's a higher percentage of, of, of um, things going to social care that are more complex for families. I think in the long term, we're thinking about what's the impact on children's social care in terms of poverty, worklessness in families, domestic abuse. Um, there's a whole load of things, I think, that across our partnerships that we're starting to think about. This isn't going to be just to the end of the pandemic. This will be for years to come in terms of how we deal with some of the issues for families. I'll let uh, Danielle just talk us through some of the regulatory changes that I mentioned earlier. OK. Thanks, Martin. So the coronavirus gui guidance came into force in um, April and um, until the 25th of September when the further guidance was issued. The purpose, of the, as, as Martin's mentioned, is to provide the flexibility, um, but only to be used when absolutely necessary. The amendments related to residential care, private fostering, care planning and fostering and adoption and they have really been in relation to timeliness, quality at meetings, um, and the opportunities to do things to do things differently. So our response in um, North Yorkshire across the Children and Family Service is to only use the flexibility when absolutely necessary, and only with um, senior management oversight, which we have been monitoring really, really closely. Very few of the flexibilities um, have been used. But where they have, they've really been in relation to virtual working, visits to children um, and families where we've rag rated um, cases. But as Martin has, has highlighted, the majority of, of visits have continued or, um, face to face, certainly across um, children in need and, ch and those children who are in need of, of pr um, protection. Also, Regulation 44 visits. Um, which are visits to children's home by an independent person. Initially, they have been undertaken um, undertaken virtually. Um, those flexibilities have come to an end, but they have been um, replaced by the secondary changes um, and they will remain in place until the 31st of March. Um, 
I think it's important to um, to note the level of oversight over the changes and that we will only be using the flexibilities where it is absolutely necessary um, always ensuring that the welfare of the child is absolutely is absolutely um, paramount. I think that the um, the, the secondary changes really um, continue to re to relate to giving some flexibility around visits where it's not where it's not possible around quality at meetings um, allowing us to do things differently certainly through so certainly through virtual working um, and um, panels and forums so uh, for example fostering an adoption panel so ensuring that they that they go ahead in, in, in timely ways but as I say we will continue to have oversight of, of those and only use where absolutely absolutely necessary I'll hand back to you Martin so Ray just to the to the final slide and uh, do apologize Ray because I realized that I wasn't asking you to move the slides on um, but just to, to the final slide I think um, in terms of, of what the service is, is really proud of is that we have continued to deliver our standard service um, and in some cases actually a better service because of the, the ability to do that some some things virtually we've just changed the delivery methods about how we do it um, but where we absolutely need to be with with uh, alongside families in family homes and certainly in the child protection arena as I say, we've done over five and a half thousand visits face to face throughout the, the, the pandemic. Um, I'm really proud of the, the staff in terms of how they've responded to that, given the fact that obviously they have all the nervousness of, um, of, of, of um, you know, having families themselves and, and parents that, that may be shielding all those sorts of issues. Um, the family time, I think, again, we're, we're really proud of the fact that we led um, the voice, I think, uh, probably nationally, I think, certainly regionally around the fact that we felt it was really important that children do see their families, um, that we don't just leave them for six months doing virtual uh, virtual visits with families. Um, it, it's really important for us that our, our, our whole practice model is based on relationship based working um, so we've done weekly videos with with children and families, social distancing walks, as I've mentioned, with the, with teenagers. But also, I think the relationship model that we use for families is also used with um, with with the workforce as well. Uh, so very recently, we've introduced a uh, almost a pyramid scheme um, that effectively every uh, every manager, every part of the pan uh, pandemic management group contacts a worker just for a conversation for uh, so they, they, they contact three uh, three staff members and um, just to have a general conversation a catch up um, and we're asking those three members to contact another three members um, just to, around people's welfare and again we're getting some some really good um, feedback from from the staff about um, that approach um, we are we are really proud of the fact that we've we've dealt with hidden or harm in a way that, that you know was getting ahead of the curve. I think we weren't waiting for things to happen, um, and we very quickly recognised that there will be children that we need to find that um, aren't being seen, and then there are families that were perhaps um, need support with that, that weren't able to go through the, the normal routes. Um, we managed to get young people doing their education as best they could um, as quickly as possible. The, de the Department for Education uh, did have a scheme around introducing Chromebooks and uh, laptops for every vulnerable learner, every child with a social worker. Um, and we've actually also had seen some great work with, we've got a number of young apprentices who are care experienced and they've done some fantastic work with us about getting just a better um, uh, a better approach in using some social media in terms of Facebook and other uh, other platforms. And I'm using Facebook because it's because I'm fairly old, but that's a, a fairly old old fashioned uh, platform. I'm told now, but they've they've helped us get a, a, um, a better link with young people that we work with through social media. And I'll stop there for questions, Chair. Thank you, Martin. I've just received a message which everybody else will in that our next item number seven. Amanda Newbold, our assistant director, can only be on board the meeting till 12 o'clock. Um, so, if Martin, I just, um, if I can just interrupt, sorry. Um, I'm just having a bit of a conversation on the side with Amanda, so I think we're OK to go to questions with Martin. And, Thank you very uh, much, Stuart. I was just concerned I didn't want to, to lose Amanda because it's the yeah. first meeting that we've actually had her presence. Thank you. I'm OK it. to hang on. OK, thank you. Right. We'll go to questions to Martin then, right? 
I've got a few here, but before I let everybody else in, because I tend to forget about that. Um, it was notable in one of the reports we got this week, I think from Richard Linton, uh, in connection with Dr. Lincoln Sargent, that a lot of these uh, COVID spreads were in families. And, and one thing I was quite interested in was, was put down to sleepovers, which I'm sure the members did with that. Um, I think the Street Ahead project is excellent for our vulnerable children, um, being in an area where we do have this and we do witness it. Um, I'm also a bit concerned with regard um, to where I know our attendances, because I've followed them, are very good within schools, but I was only made aware where children probably, where English is a second language, because some of the older family are shielding, some of the children are not being able to attend school. Have we got any things like this within our area? And also, I brought up the meeting yesterday to do with looked after, where we are doing regulation 44 visits virtually. Could the member be uh, invited to it, please? So I've sent a few up there, but it was the, the sleepover one that caught me and, and how we're intermingling and how, in fact, it has created quite a little epidemic within two families. OK, thank you, Martin. Sh shall I tackle the, the sleepover issue? Um, yeah, my my understanding of the sleepover issue is that that was part of a particular um, um, dance school and shouldn't have been happening in that way. And um, it's one of those things. I don't, I think the reality is most families across the county take this very seriously and follow the rules that are uh, put out. But there will always be um, times and families who don't. And we we, um, ad we address that when we find it. Yeah, we can't, we can't put out advice in advance then through schools or anything. No, no. Um, OK. I everyone, know, just... everyone knows the rules. Yes, I know. OK. It's for them to decide whether they are going to keep to them or not. OK. Just to pick up the other issues, Chair, just so the English as second language, I'm not aware that that's an issue. Um, so there will be um, even people that are obviously um, aren't attending school. But what we have said and what the government's made very clear right throughout this process and schools have been absolutely been superb to be quite honest um is that all vulnerable children say so any child with a social worker and we've extended that actually more broadly to to um, children that we feel are vulnerable with uh, perhaps other workers such an early, uh, such as an early help worker um all of which have been able to attend school um, through this process so those that um need to attend have had the the, the abil ability to do so um for others that um, there's been a, a, a small number that perhaps have been with foster carers where they've been a little reluctant because they've been shielding themselves or because of their age we've got quite a, a, an older uh, population of foster carers um, so that's where we put in education buddies um, so we very quickly set up a scheme for education buddies to make sure that people weren't missing out in terms of the reg 44 visits um, certainly I'll take that back um, it wasn't aware that the, the uh, members weren't um, involved um, so we'll, we'll ensure that that happens. Um, Thank you Martin. Um, I've, I've got a hand but I can't see who it is that's put up. Uh, that may be me. Uh, oh Tom thank Cap you Tom Cabell Taylor, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm not, this question might be more broadly addressed to Stuart and people but um, you've not mentioned schools much uh, and some of the earlier talks talked about schools. Um, my experience at the moment is that the reopening of schools has put a lot of pressure on the senior leadership teams of all the schools that I'm aware of because they're having to enforce social distancing and do extra time duties um, and things may settle down but the schools I'm aware of the leadership team is very exhausted uh, They've risen to the challenge, all the teachers have, and I've heard quite junior teachers just say, you know, we really appreciate our leaders at the moment because they're doing a, a good job. The question relates to this, that, that people can only run at 200% for so long. And a lot has been put on schools and 
they get deluged with new regulations at the moment. And I think my feeling is that schools prioritise vulnerable people and alert the council. It's, you know, it's one of the things that they, they always do. But when the system is running very hot, uh, people make mistakes uh, and, and things suddenly deteriorate. They haven't yet, uh, but I see a lot of very exhausted people. And I just think you should be aware and be ready to adapt to when one or two schools um, find that they can't, they can't continue the level of service that they normally do. Um, so that, it's kind of a point, but I've not heard you talk about schools, um, but they are under strain. Yes, thanks. Shall I respond to that? I mean, um, Martin and Danielle haven't to spoken about schools much because this was about children's social care. So it's not a deliberate omission. It's about we were updating on children's social care and the response from the services. And I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. Um, schools, um, that, those questions are probably more appropriate for um, Amanda um, when it's her slot. So if it, um, rather, again, than me steal some of the thunder from Amanda, it might be worth us um, parking that and coming back to it um, for, for Amanda's bit. I understand your point entirely. Um, and share some of those concerns, but we can talk to you about some of the ways we're working with schools um, to help them through this. Um, at times of difficulty, you're absolutely right, we need to have joint leadership and be in it together so everyone feels supported. And that is that has been our approach from day one with our schools to say we're in this together and we're going to put an arm around you. And we've worked very hard at that. Um, my, my, I'm, just while I am talking, I will make a general comment. I don't know if there are any more questions. Um, I am incredibly proud of our frontline staff that have gone out despite personal circumstances day in, day out to keep children and families safe and supported in North Yorkshire. I don't think they get the recognition they deserve. Everyone is always quick to applaud the other, quite rightly, services such as the NHS. This is a forgotten part of the country and I am immensely proud of what our staff have done and um, they should be recognised more for it. I think we'll all echo that, Stuart. I think the whole committee will. Well, thank you for your comments and I hope they'll be noted. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Martin before we move on to item seven? I'm conscious of time and people having to leave. Thank you very much, Martin, and to Danielle for that excellent coverage. Very much appreciated. So if members agree, we'll move on to item seven, which we're very, very honoured to have really um, at its stage. A presentation, Education Our Greatest Liberator, attainment for 2019. And I'd like to bring on Amanda Newbold, our Assistant Director. Welcome to our meeting. Thank you very much and um, thank you for inviting me to present this um, data from 2019. Hopefully there'll be an opportunity if there are questions about the 2020 situation that um, we can cover afterwards. Um, so this is my first of these meetings. I joined the uh, local authority in August and so I'm picking up this performance information from over 12 months ago um, and please bear with me as I, I go through it with you. So 2019 summer results relating to the 1890 in academic year did see some strong performance in North Yorkshire, uh, certainly in key stage four and in key stage five, which uh, relate to the GCSE and A-level uh, qualifications, those performance above regional and um, national equivalents. We also saw some improvements across North Yorkshire in primary schools, particularly in maths and um, improvements in phonics and in early years, which remains just above the national and regional averages. Despite that, there have been some challenges uh, there's been a drop in the performance of reading in primary schools and also there are some gaps in the data so the performance we're seeing overall doesn't yet represent the performance um, equally for all children. There are some um, differences for children in schools in coastal areas particularly uh, the Scarborough district which has lower performance um, than other areas and there are some vulnerable groups children that are disadvantaged and um, accessing free school meals uh, that are generally lower than their peers um, in the county. 
So um, alongside the academic performance, we've also seen uh, a drop in some of the Ofsted judgments in our primary and secondary schools uh, and therefore across the board. What um, if we take each of the areas separately and start with early years, we have seen um, performance at a good level of development, which is the overall um, expectation for five year old children leaving the reception class. We've seen uh, that performance remain above national, although there has been some decline, so it's getting closer to the national level. Um, and um, again, Scarborough, we've seen that being lower than the rest of the county, although it has, in, has shown some increase in 2019 and we believe that reflects the emphasis that's been in early years in the opportunity area and the work that's been going on there. When we look at key stage one, there has been, and this is the seven year olds, the year two children, there was a, a downturn in some of the performance in the overall combined reading, writing and maths where the gaps with national are widening and in fact it, this is the widest gap for children um, across the different phases of education, um, particularly in reading uh, where there was some uh, decrease based on the year before and again in Rydale and Scarborough they were the two districts that saw the lowest um, performance at Key Stage 1. In Key Stage 2, um, there was a slight increase in the combined attainment of the proportions of children achieving the national expectations in reading, writing and maths. Um, but the gap with the national measure remains at 2% and it has done over or did do over a period of years up to 2019. Particularly, um, we saw some improvements in maths, so that's continued to improve since 2017 and is going in the right direction, but still remains below national. Um, unfortunately, however, we saw decreases in reading um, across all of the districts in 2019. If we move on to talk about the secondary schools, there's a slight increase in the attainment eight, attainment eight measure um, across the, the county. We saw Harrogate perform the highest, uh, Craven the most improved and Scarborough have um, the lowest figures of performance and saw some decline from the previous year. Um, Progress 8, which is the measure of how much a child has improved in their um, academic performance from primary school through to the end of the year 11 uh, secondary school period, um, it remains above national but has seen three years um, of a drop in performance. Again, Harriet, uh, Harriet, sorry, Harrogate has the highest um, performance in Progress 8 and there are three districts where that's below zero, so children aren't making the expected progress across the board and that is Hambleton, Richmondshire and Scarborough. In terms of groups of children, um, we see that the children eligible for free school meals and the pupil premium funding that is attached to that we have seen some um, gaps in performance for those children, as I said earlier. Um, typically, there's about a 5% difference for children um, achieving their against their peers nationally for children who are in that eligible group. So um, although in early years it's improving performance for, for children eligible for free school meals, it remains below national. Primary school, the um, performance remains very similar to the year before and key stage four we saw some slight improvements but again remaining just below um, the national equivalents. Similarly uh, there is a picture for children who are receiving intervention for special educational needs again um, gaps of from one to three or four percent depending on the different key stages in early years key stage two um, in key stage four the pupils with SEN are performing fairly equivalent to their peers nationally um, for progress eight and, and attainment eight the other the other two groups that we we'll look at are the children with English as an additional language and again um, performing slightly lower than their peers in North Yorkshire across the different key stages, although some improvements uh, being seen. And in key stage four, the uh, children with English as an additional language perform um, at a higher rate than their peers nationally, but slightly lower than children in North Yorkshire as a group. And then the other um, group that we'd look at is service children and again we see some differences in performance for service children when compared to other children in North Yorkshire. In early years there's a three and a half percentage point gap 
Um, this actually widens to a seven percentage point gaps at key stage two. And then in terms of attainment eight, this can be almost a three point gap um, in, in their performance. So um, what we're seeing, I suppose, is some performance that is um, good in compared to regional comparisons, but also um, there are some, some gaps that still need to close for some groups of children when we look at the 2019 data. If I move to talk about um, attendance, what we see in primary schools is a picture that's very similar to national and doesn't seem to be um, changing. But for secondary school children, whilst attendance is similar to national, there's a small group of persistent absenteeism that is um, increasing slightly and is therefore um, attendances below, absences above, whichever way you look at it, the uh, national comparison for secondary schools. Um, and then the final point I would make is regarding the um, young people uh, priority three, equipping young people for life in a North Yorkshire economy. So we're seeing increasing performance um, at A level um, particularly with the grades for uh, an AAB set of grades and the average point score for technical level um, entries. But what we're seeing is still some gaps below national and regional benchmarks. So there's further work to go, but definitely um, heading in the right direction there. And then the number of 16 and 17 year olds who are not in education, employment or training um, is below the regional benchmarks. But there is a higher than um, average amount of children that are unknown. So we haven't got the destination data for those children. Um, and I think I'll take some questions from you if you want regarding 2019. What I can just say before we do that is that um, you'll obviously be aware from the media and particularly the last two weeks of August, it was the top story, um, the end of year assessments for primary age children and the external examinations for secondary age children this year um, were obviously cancelled. So while schools did issue results to individuals, local authorities have been clearly instructed not to use any assessment data for comparison or monitoring purposes. So we don't intend to do that and we won't be collating that information um, in a format that would um, enable any comparisons to be made. What we are doing is working with the schools to make sure that they are supporting the pupils with the necessary catch up work that they need to do to make sure that next year's cohort of children um, are able to leave with the best um, set of exams or assessments, whatever they may be next year available to them. And um, where necessary, making sure that you Yeah, but it's all right. Um, sorry. Have you prepared any lunch? Sorry, um, making sure that uh, young people are supported with those um, interventions that they may need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. And can I thank you really for a really very comprehensive report. But I think it, as chairman as well and where I'm located, and I think Councillor Plant will probably come in as well, it would be remiss of us not to mention um, the levels in the Scarborough district, which covers Scarborough, Whitby and Filey. Um, uh, but the opportunity area funding, as you so rightly say, has made a difference, especially to our early years. So hopefully this will transpose through the school settings as we go through. Um, as Stuart knows, one of my obvious questions is key stage two. And we still got the 2% gap, which is it seems to have been going on for years. But I am slightly lightened by the fact that the key stage one seems to be improving. So hopefully when they move into key stage two, we will have some better figures over the next few years. Obviously, the interventions are working with that. So I, I was quite concerned, as I say, about the things on the coast. Compliment you on the fact of the um, increase in qualifications that our people are achieving. And attendance, I agree with you. There is, there is the, where the primary level is raised, there is a concern with secondary. And I, I think, you know, that's probably, as you say, 2019, not within the COVID. And um, I'll probably leave it there to let somebody else have a word. But that's my main things I'm concerned about. And um, and also with regards to the SEND, we seem to have a little bit of improvement in that, in especially key stage two. Even though we've got increased numbers, we seem to be levelling out on, on ability. So 
I'll I'll leave those as my questions. I know you can't probably give me an immediate answer, Amanda. It'll be ongoing with the progress, but just to say that the opportunity area, I think funding has helped the coast. And, and anything else we can have in that score would be much appreciated, I'm sure. Thank you. Yeah. So the opportunity area funding has been extended for another year. You're probably mm -hmm. already aware of yeah. that. Yeah. And the focus, yeah. I suppose, for us is is the sustainability. So during this year, we're actually looking beyond this year. So what are the successes? What are the areas uh, that we need to really build on the partnerships that that opportunity area funding has created? And how can we make sure we learn from the successes um, and take that across the district and uh, and make sure that that's embedded after the opportunity area um, project ends. Thank you. It is it is within our work plan. Um, it's the opportunity area, so we welcome the further report. The okay. other questions, I think uh, you'll be aware, they're just ongoing, really. Um, I'm conscious that um, Dr. Cabell Taylor did have a question that he raised in the previous one. I don't know whether he, I don't know whether he wants to repeat it, but maybe Amanda, you were here. Yes, we want to give him some reassurances. I know our director has, yeah. but I think we, you know, we spoil your thunder to let you just say what you're doing as well. Thank you. OK, um, so I'd like to reiterate what Stuart said about uh, how proud we are about the work that schools have done. So if I can just start by saying that, um, you know, it was amazing that when we got to the 7th of September every school in North Yorkshire was open to its its pupils all schools had risk assessments in place uh, the transport network was running and we're seeing attendance that's above national actually in North Yorkshire at the moment um, mm -hmm. for the data that's coming through mm -hmm. and at, and North Yorkshire above other local authorities is having almost every one of its school return its attendance data um, to the DfE so we can really see a true picture uh, of attendance. Um, what we know is that uh, school leaders are working very hard. They're making sure their schools are safe. And we've seen where well, we have seen cases in schools, it's been very few. So there might be one or two. There are actions taken then to make sure everybody's isolated and the spread doesn't happen in the school. Um, and that's so far so good in terms of um, that. But we know that that doesn't come without a lot of hard work from head teachers, leadership teams, governors, teachers, everybody in, in school. Um, the focus that they've had in terms of learning has been has been on the catch up activities. They've been trying to balance this um, idea of teaching in the classroom in the normal way, but being ready to switch on and go to remote learning, uh, which we know is doubling the workload for some people. And it's an issue that we have escalated to the DfE. We have regular conversations with the DfE, uh, daily emails and, and weekly conversations where we pass on our concerns. And indeed, we have done that from September, right from the start. We've taken feedback from schools. We've had a number of engagement sessions. I think there's been five in the last few weeks around leadership networks works. We've had sessions with um, public health colleagues, HR, health and safety, offering advice um, to leaders to try and share some of that burden which we know that they're carrying at the moment. What um, what we're continuing to do is ensure that every school and academy in the authority has a named advisor that they can contact if they just have concerns that they're not sure where to take them or they just want to, um, you know, have an inquiry or, or offload, whatever it is that's going on in their schools. And we're making sure that we are available for schools. Many of them still wanting to work remotely with us, but some of them wanting us to go into schools and continue um, to work on on business as usual work as well as the COVID response. So we are aware, we are supporting heads, we're talking to them and we're passing on um, the concerns back either to the diocese, to the DfE, to Ofsted in our regular communication um, with those. So I hope that's reassuring for you. Yeah, I think, I think the concern is uh, not to burden them with too many new things at the moment. I know you, you've talked about all the initiatives and we're desperate to improve things, but um, I think just just maintaining where we are this year would be a success because some of them could slip back. Um, and I think being vigilant as to those that start to go out of control and, and put the efforts there. Um, yep. And... and 
So and I can just respond to that. So um, the school improvement advisors are doing a sort of desktop analysis around a school, looking at the website, um, you know, the sort of performance information, but also how schools are responding, whether they're engaging with, with some of the support that's available. And they're also um, over this first few weeks of half term every school's had at least a one hour phone call with an advisor where they've been able to take that feedback and talk about the particular concerns around that school and what the focus is um, and we're using that information to um, categorize the schools and the level of support that they'll need looking at those that are perhaps in a window for an Ofsted inspection and that might want additional support in uh, to prepare for that so we are making sure that the focus is on those schools where we know there are vulnerabilities is where leaders have either shared with us or others have shared with us um, some of those additional concerns. Is that okay? That's, thank you that's very great. much, that's Amanda. Great. Very comprehensive. Does that satisfy your question, Tom? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Just the, what I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, have we any other questions for Amanda? There is a hand. I can't see whose it is. It looks like John Mann. Right. Thank yeah. you. I'm glad you can yeah. see it. You've thank got you. a different. I can't get all the screen on. Yeah. Councillor Mann, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm conscious of time. It was only a quick one. Just to say, just to add my congratulations to the uh, the school teams. I think, as the previous speaker said, it was a fantastic achievement to get all the schools open in North Yorkshire by the 7th of September. I think that must have been a huge uh, ask and I think it's a fantastic achievement. Just quickly looking at the report, could I just briefly compare two tables and ask a, a, a brief question? Uh, the tables um, I'm looking at are the, uh, the percentage of acad academies in North Yorkshire, which is on page, is it? It's, it's contained in the overview of schools section in the report. Yeah. And I note there that, um, yeah, that's the first table. And the second table is the, um, uh, the, the percentage of pupils attending good or outstanding schools, where, again, we've done fantastically well. Uh, I was just looking at the figures for um, uh, in North Yorkshire and comparing it with the region. That's the Yorkshire and Humberside um, performance. I see in, this, in North Yorkshire in the secondary uh, column, is at 79, nearly 80%, whereas the, the regional average for Yorkshire and the Humberside is 73. So we're doing well above uh, the regional performance. But if you look at the, the column for primary, uh, the, whilst the Yorkshire and Humberside uh, percentage of pupils attending good or outstanding schools is just over 82. For North Yorkshire, it's just fractionally, it's nothing to worry about, I don't think, but it's just fractionally below um, the regional performance. That's, I'm saying that the North Yorkshire um, uh, percentage there is 81.5. So I just wondered um, if there was anything we could do about that longer term. I'm conscious of what Tom, the previous speaker, was saying about um, no further initiatives this year. And I think that's a great idea because obviously we're, we've got, got our hands full coping with COVID. But medium term, I just wondered, would we be able to, or do we see any mileage in getting um, the percentage of good or outstanding schools figure up in the primary sector? Would it help if a greater proportion of our primary schools were academies? I'm just noting that only 28% of our primary schools are academies, whereas in the secondary sector, um, over half, 52%, are, you know, apologies for the long question. No, I think there's a few questions in that question. So I'll, I'll start with the first one. Um, so the gap in performance between North Yorkshire and the region for secondary, I think you said was, I haven't got what you're reading in front of me, but around uh, three percentage points, is that correct? Um, Say that again, sorry. So you, the gap between the North Yorkshire performance for secondary schools and the regional performance, um, I think you said, was it 79 and 82-ish? Um, for this is this is for good and outstanding schools. Yes, secondary schools. Well, it, it was actually um, the North Yorkshire figure was for secondaries was tremendous yeah. at seven, nearly eighty percent. Yes. Whereas the regional figure was seventy-three and a half. So that's yeah. that's six so, and a half percent. 
So um, just to be mindful that there are 43 secondary schools, so each one represents two percentage points. So we're probably uh, two, three schools above uh, the regional performance there, aren't we? Um, with primary schools, we've got 305 primary schools, so they're each worth a, a approximately a third of a percent. So the gap difference is probably, again, a handful of schools. So um, mm. I think it's it, it's good for us to be mindful of the numbers behind those figures when we make comparisons. Um, Going to the last question you asked, is there something for us to do to to improve that? Absolutely, that that's my job, and that's that's what I'm here to do, and that's my priority. Um, what we what we've started to look at within the service, although not necessarily gone out to schools with this directly at the moment, is um, looking at the change in the Ofsted inspection framework, the impact that that's having on the inspections in the authority, because we have seen the most recent round of inspections that actually have come since um, the 2019 to. 20 academic year. Um, we have seen some of our schools fall um, during that period and we think it's because of the demands of the inspection on the curriculum and the new expectations mm -hmm. and the difficulties that there are for small schools to um, get that full range of curriculum and the levels of progression that required for children at different age groups and to really demonstrate that which um, when compared to other areas where schools are bigger and there's a greater capacity amongst the staff team um, that that's more possible so we're starting to look at why um, schools haven't been performing what the learning might be for other schools where where schools are doing it well because there are schools doing it well as you say um, and so that's work that school improvement team are doing in readiness um, for inspections to restart in the new year and that's why we're focusing our support on those that are in the window because our first priority is to make sure that schools don't decline in their performance at the next inspection inspection and alongside that it's making sure that those that can improve a grade do improve a grade. Um, with regard to the question on whether academies uh, and the conversion would make a difference. There is no evidence for us to support that the status of a school will make a difference to its performance. What matters is the leadership and governance of a school and that's where our priority um, will be in investing in, in development for governors and leaders. Right. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think, can I write in this, Amanda, that some of these Ofsted ratings are quite historic. Yes. Uh, because some schools that have got outstanding might not have been inspected for 10 years or more. Absolutely. And at yeah. the moment, Ofsted are consulting on whether to yeah. um, continue to, or, uh, to not inspect or to bring in, uh, remove that exemption so that they would then inspect um, any school regardless of its current judgment. Yeah, because I think over the over the years, it has been quite unfair to some schools uh, that have been judged against the ones that haven't. And as you so rightly say, things can change. Um, but I, I know that what um, the council was referring to there, but there's, there's a greater proportion, as you pointed out, of primary schools than we have secondary schools anyway. Mm -hmm. Is anyone else wanting to ask a question, please? Anybody else, Ray? At all, I can't see anything. Uh, I don't believe so, Chairman. Okay. Thank you. And I thank you very much, Amanda, for that very comprehensive report. We look forward to, to further developments. And thank you, Stuart, as well, for all your help. And as Stuart reiterated there, I think it is a thank to every, every school and every voluntary sector and everybody that, that what they've done throughout the covid situation and in fact some schools haven't even closed have they because they've been open for uh, first line you know frontline workers mm -hmm. so it, it the pressure is is on them we know and i know that you will support them in every way you can so on behalf of everyone thank you very much okay. and thank you and i look forward to coming back with some more good news for you <laughs> you will you will be. A, lot, a lot of it is good news you yes. know it's the future we've got to look at isn't it absolutely thank you, thank so you and i hope the rest of the meeting goes well we've just got the work program which i turn to to ray now please which is page 49 to 53 uh thank you chairman i'll be uh very brief if i may um you see on the work programme that the list of items is, in all honesty, looking a bit thin. Uh, so we need to do some work on that. That's largely a result of the, the committee not meeting on a regular basis, but also working on the understanding that the service 
has some priorities that it absolutely needs to attend to. Um, so looking ahead to the next few meetings, I think there's a there's a consensus that we shouldn't overload the committee with items, particularly if we're having virtual meetings. So you and your group spokespersons will be doing some work on the groups on the uh, work programme, obviously in conjunction with Stuart uh, and his colleagues. Um, there will, of course, as there was today, be some focus on the, the COVID response. And I know scrutiny chairs are looking into how each of the scrutiny committees uh, look at this. Uh, certainly Martin and Daniel's um, uh, presentation early in the meeting kind of sets the table for you, uh, if you like, um, uh, but only particularly in relation to social care. Uh, clearly, there's other wider aspects within the remit of the committee that you'll want to talk about. It was mentioned earlier that the, about the Coastal Opportunity Programme, some questions to uh, Amanda on that. That is indeed, as you rightly say, Chairman, down for consideration by the committee. That's in February. And it's the same date for adoption procedures, which was due today. But as I mentioned, uh, we swapped that and covered some of the um, the, the services response to uh, COVID. Uh, other than that, uh, Chairman, I, I don't have anything uh, more to add other than obviously I know you and your group spokespersons, as am I, open to suggestions about what the, might, the committee might want to cover uh, in the next few meetings. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Rain. Thank you for your support and Patrick, as always. Members, thank you. Thank you to our portfolio holders for attending as well. Very much appreciated. And, um, and to our directors and all the officers. Thank you, members. Stay safe, stay well. We look forward to our next meeting. Thank you very much. Bye. Chairman.